I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, a number of excellent guest uh, panellists who are going to talk to us uh, a little bit about the, uh, how you successfully return uh, from work. And, uh, of course, what I'm now doing is looking for the, the right one because I can't find it. There it is. I shouldn't have got two bits of paper up. I knew what we were talking about. I've just been looking out for the last 50 minutes as well. Isn't that typical? Anyway, so... Uh, our facilitator is Sarah Restall. She's from Time to Change, uh, which is a campaign that you may know that Rethink Mental Illness, where I'm based, and uh, Mind Run Together. And she's the employer manager there, so well-placed to talk about that issue. She'll also be accompanied by Lauren Hearn from the BBC. And are you sitting under your... Very good. This is, that's, been, that's been seamless all day, I must say. A, a Glenn Dunn, who clearly is by a process of elimination from Foster's, and Lucy Finn from Bernardo's. So, Sarah, over to you. Great. Hi, everybody. It's lovely to see you all here today. Uh, I just want to give a bit of context as to why I've been invited to facilitate this panel. And it's not just because I'm super good looking or a really, really good <laughs> speaker, but those are both true facts. Um, it, is, <laughs> it is also because I have the experience of being signed out of work when I was, um, this was just last year actually, I signed out of work with anxiety. I remember going to my doctor and bawling my eyes out and it wasn't to do with work and she said, oh, I think you need to take some time off work and I remember sobbing and saying, but I love my job and her saying, well, it's my job to make sure that you are mentally well and you're not fit for work. So then I had two weeks off and uh, was, was potentially going to take more and more time off. I, I live with anxiety. Um, clearly, it doesn't affect me up here, but it affects me on public transport and so forth, so it's pretty bad. Um, but, yeah, when, uh, when I was off work, one of the biggest things that I was concerned about was returning to work. And, in fact, the fear of that was quite extreme. And I remember the one, one major, major thing was my, my boss, Emma Mamo, and the workplace wellbeing team at Mind. And you'd expect this from something called the workplace wellbeing team. But she actually gave me a call before I was due to come back to work and it was her words that really inspired me to return to work and probably made the entire process so much nicer, which was, we're here for you, we've got your back. And it just made me feel so amazing. And when I came back into work, it was on phased return, but I ended up not needing it. And I truly felt that from my team and from my managers that actually they did have my back. So that's why I'm here today and that's why I was asked to sort of facilitate this panel as I've got first-hand experience of that, as well as the work that I do with employers to sort of support them with managing people returning to work. So um, I'll just let my lovely panel introduce themselves as well and tell you a bit about themselves. We see. So I'm Laura Hearn and I'm... Um, sorry, Laura. Sorry. <laughs> I'll just jump in. <laughs> Do it. Um, so yeah, I'm a producer of BBC Television News and um, my story is, is pretty much um, been mostly positive in my return to work. Um, in 2012, I um, took eight months out of work as my role as a producer to go to an inpatient facility in the States um, to recover from anorexia. Um, and it had been uh, something that had been kind of an elephant in the room, I would say, uh, in the workplace. <laughs> um, something that everyone knew about but didn't really want to talk to me about. It was like, um, uh, yeah, no one really kind of ever said the word, but they all knew. Um, and I was probably talked about quite a lot behind my back, which... Now it doesn't really make me feel so great, but I guess that's kind of what you do when you're concerned about someone. You don't actually know how to speak to them themselves. Um, so uh, I was obviously, you know, I got to a critical point where I, I relapsed very badly and my family were incredibly grateful. I, I managed to go and get some treatment in the States. And um, my first point of call was not any EAP program or anything else to do with HR. It was literally speaking to my, um, my line manager, who was kind of a surrogate dad to me a bit at the time, and he took me into the car park, and I just bawled my eyes out, and I just said, like, I've got to go. This is what's wrong with me. And he said, you go. Like, don't worry if you need six months, whatever. And, and, and I never actually spoke to anybody else, really, other than, other than him. And um, 
he really did get to grips with me, probably because he had an experience with his mother. He had depression. So he had that kind of empathy. But I later found out that while I was away, he pulled all sorts of strings to help with my pay and returning to work. And um, returning to work was pretty difficult, actually. When you come back physically different and mentally different and you walk into a huge newsroom. The BBC newsroom is, can be quite intimidating <laughs> at times. And you walk down there, down the staircase, and you think, oh my god, uh, like everyone, here I am, everyone's going to see me. And, but actually, everyone was pretty amazing. Um, they didn't actually really directly sort of acknowledge the word. No one ever uses the word anorexia or eating disorder, because it's kind of got, it's got a horrible kind of thing to it. Even I find it difficult. But they did all just say, you know, it's really great to have you back. And, um, that just made a huge, huge difference to me. Um, but I do have to say that I was very lucky. There are many managers in that newsroom who I would say are emotionally constipated and would ha have absolutely no idea what to say or do for me. And all mine did was give me a hug and say it's okay. And that was much better than me. I would never have picked up an EAP phone or line or, or spoken to someone I had no idea about. I just needed a hug and someone to be human with me. Um, and returning to work, I again needed someone to be there for being human to me. And, and so for that, I'm incredibly grateful. So yeah, that's Thank me. Thank you, Laura. Lucy? Um, I'm coming at this from a different perspective. I'm, I'm Lucy Finn. I'm the head of HR for Bernardo Scotland. Um, we have, um, and it's a children's services side of Bernardo, so it's the frontline staff that are dealing with um, the most vulnerable children in um, society, really. They do a really hard job. Um, they deal with some very difficult situations and we have quite a high level of um, absence and quite a high level of long-term absence in Bernardo's and a lot of that is around mental health. Um, some of it is um, secondary trauma, vicarious trauma um, to do very much with the work they do and um, my experience in coming into Bernardo's was very much that I thought we'd be brilliant at this in Bernardo's or mental health. I thought this is our job, this is what we do externally, you know, then this is exactly what we do as our job. We're bound to be great at looking after our staff in this way. And I was, I guess, surprised to find that we weren't, that actually the stuff that staff and managers did externally with children and young people didn't relate internally and they were really struggling to talk about their mental health, to um, deal with it effectively and to... Um, facilitate things like a good return to work after absence and to have those really good discussions in the workplace. So um, my, the way I'm coming at this, I guess, and why I've been invited is at the time I've been there for about three years, I've done quite a lot of work in terms of facilitating much better return to work, facilitating much better conversations in the workplace. And, and that's what I've been asked to speak about today. Thank you so much, Lucy. And Glenn. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Glenn Dunn. I'm a partner uh, in a Mayfair law firm, Forsters, um, and just over five years ago, um, I had a period of absence uh, for about 10 weeks from work. Um, I had, was diagnosed with um, severe anxiety and severe depression. Um, as with all these things, it sort of creep up on you gradually, um, and you know, I'd realised for some time before that I wasn't really coping. Um, you know, I was struggling to, to sleep, um, I, I wasn't really uh, being productive at work um, and uh, I just you know, really wasn't, wasn't fit to be there. Making decisions was almost impossible um, and I'd sort of get into work and I'd just hope the day would um, get, get, I'd get through the day as quickly as I could and go home and then you know, try and sleep and then repeat, repeat the whole exercise. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, I realised that, uh, well, I literally couldn't get out of bed um, one morning. I absolutely hit the wall. Um, so I realised that I, I need to take some action. So I saw the GP and uh, I was signed off work. And, you know, I'd spent probably the next two weeks in pretty much free fall of not knowing um, what I was doing, uh, not really thinking at all rationally, being absolutely terrified about the future and even getting you know, through the next hour that was ahead of me. Um, and uh, it took me all, you know, at least two weeks, I think, to actually gather my thoughts to think about w what I was going to do next. Um, and so I, I decided to um, seek psychotherapy help. 
um, and uh, I carried that on through through the time that I was um, off work, um, and I started reading quite a lot about um, the sort of psychology of what was happening to me, so that I can understand, you know, the really awkward, uncomfortable feelings that I was going through, um, and uh, you know, sort of bit by bit, you know, some some sense of normality um, started to um, to return, and you know, I then worked out how I was going to su successfully return to work. Wow. Uh, first of all, thank you for speaking so candidly about this. It's, um, it's the only thing that can really break down stigma is when people are just expressing the way that it, it feels for them so clearly and honestly. And thank you because the, the room is so silent and I think that's in response to your authenticity. Um, I just want to kind of touch on the idea of the barriers that you can experience when you return to work. Um, so. Laura, if we could come back to you on that. So you, you talked about how that, that first moment or that day when you came back into work, that you were really conscious that people could look, were looking at you and that they could see a physical difference in you. What, what barriers were, did you sort of come up against in that first couple of weeks getting back into work? What, what happened for you? Um, I think when, when, you, when I, for me, when I came back to work, um, everyone was kind of a little cautious. I was treated quite as a fragile person. And, um, and I was in some, in some ways, I, I guess I, I wasn't. I, I probably think in some ways they still possibly treat me in, as a fragile person. But um, I mean, for me, it was very much, you know, they said, you know, my editor said, you can send some emails do this, do that, just sit behind a desk. And um, for four weeks, that was quite nice, actually. <laughs> I kind of uh, potted about. And um, but then kind of afterwards, I thought, geez, I've just been somewhere. And I've kind of really learned who I am as a person. I've, I've, I'm, a, I'm a different, I'm the same person, but different. And um, many of the characteristics that um, were really unhealthy in my eating disorder, my tenacity, my ambition, my perfectionism, I actually had learned to use those for the better. And so I sat there and I thought, oh, actually, this is really getting quite boring now. Um, so I came up with an idea to go and interview a pop star um, who was in town and uh, had no idea if I could pull it off. Um, and, but I suggested it. And they said, oh, pff, are you sure you're OK about this? You know? And I, so I, I kind of faked it as I, did to get my, <laughs> as I did to get my foot in the door in the first place. Um, a bit of BS helped quite a lot. And, um, and I, so off I went to East London and I, I pulled it off and it made a really good programme. And after that, um, you know, I, my confidence grew I, I, and they then allowed me to do more. Um, so for me, it was really a combination of personal responsibility alongside corporate responsibility. Um, for me, I had to really take myself out of my comfort zone and do things that actually I was a bit unsure about. But I guess that is very much in parallel to my own recovery. I had to go out of my comfort zone excruciatingly <laughs> in times in treatment and, and continue to do so in order to progress. And so that kind of ran parallel with my work um, life. And, and the more I did it, the more confident I grew and it gave them confidence. And, and then I, you know, I, I ended up doing my current role at the moment, which is, which is something that I kind of created for myself. And, and I think it's very much, you know, we often sit back and think, um, well, what are you going to do for me to support me? And a lot of that talk has been around that today. But actually, some of it has to come from within. Um, and so, for me, I guess a message would be as a, as a company to allow your employer to do that. Don't treat them, treat them cautiously because you can be quite vulnerable when you're returning back from work. But also allow them the space to... to to develop and there have been times you know we you know I work in a breaking news environment and you know there have been a few terror situations that you know they've deployed to and there was one time when I could hear the footsteps coming into the newsroom and I knew they were coming to me because I was on a planning shift can you go to Westminster and I had a panic attack mm. don't know why perhaps I was bogged down other stuff and I just couldn't go I went to the toilets and cried <laughs> and my editor's like it's fine we'll, we'll send someone else and and um and at the time you think, phew, but then also you then think, ah, oh, well, they're never going to ask me to do something else again because yeah. they deem you as fragile. And that is the risk you run. But, um, 
it didn't. I've been asked to do other things, such as the Royal Wedding, and I, and I did that. And, and so that is really um, gratitude to my editor who has believed in me and continued to support me in that way. But, um, yeah, I, gu I guess my, your resilience is built by going out of your comfort zone, but being enabled to do that. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Lucy, just from the employer's aspect and the HR aspect, could you speak a little bit about barriers that you're aware of when people are returning to work? So in that first couple of weeks, what kind of things would you anticipate yeah. them coming up against? I mean, I think what Laura's saying is really true. That whole personal versus corporate responsibility is absolutely true for us. Um, we really try. I think what's difficult is the idea of coming back into a workplace and having to explain to everybody and everyone looking at you and you, mm. what do they know, what don't they know, yeah. what are they saying. So uh, we do quite a lot of work around giving someone agency and um, actually do you want to give the message, how much do you want to tell the team, how can I facilitate yeah. that as a manager. So a manager would have that conversation with somebody who's been off, um, what do you want to say, how should we manage it, how do you want to introduce it, how much do you want to say, how much can the team know and how do they support you. So it's a really holistic approach, it's not just it's all your responsibility, it's all my responsibility as a manager, it is a whole responsibility. Mm -hmm. So um, someone coming back to work might need to say actually um, to manage my anxiety coming back, what I'm going to need is probably to come in late some days. And I want to tell the team that so they don't think I'm shirking and they understand what that is and why that is. And also, the team might want to know what it looks like when I'm not feeling well. Mm. And I want my team around me to be able to notice when I'm feeling anxious. So that might be, um, I'm not taking my lunch break. I am head down on my computer and not interacting. And I want to let the team know that so they can then say, are you okay? So that sort of agency, I think, really helps in terms of some of those barriers. And I also like your point about that you came back and then you weren't well again, you couldn't mm. do something. I think the idea that it's fluid, mm. that it's not like, oh, well, you're back and there you go, that's all great. Yeah. Um, you know, these are very fluid um, illnesses and they, it, it might be, you might be fine for a number of weeks or months and then something else might happen. Mm. So it's that keeping aware of it and having those discussions at supervision, at kind of appraisals, at one-to-ones. So it's kind of on the agenda. It's not everything about you but it's just there and your manager and your team are aware of that and keep having those conversations so that it kind of normalises it. Yeah. And we're just having, um, actually, how are you? How are you managing with things? Well, actually, this hasn't been a great week. And you can just keep having those. That, that I think, really helps some of the barriers. That's what we try and do. I think that's really, um, that's touched a nerve with me because from what you're both saying about that fragility, there was one of the biggest barriers for me coming back into the workplace was not that I'd be treated as fragile, but, but it was that I was well. Like, I'd taken two weeks, and I got well. I was back to my normal bouncy self, and I was worried that I was going to get back into the workplace, and people were going to go, you, you seem OK. Yeah. <laughs> Why were you off for two weeks? Or, you know, concerned that even when I was off, that I couldn't do anything fun, because I come from that school of thought where my mum used to say, if you're sick, you can't do anything fun. And so there was definitely, everyone, everyone in the room is nodding, right? Yeah, so you can't go to parties and you can't hang out with people. <laughs> you can't do anything fun if you're sick. So there, was, there were these barriers as well. And what you're saying is that um, the transparency and you with your, your manager and you as a manager is the thing that helped me was to be able to come in and say to everybody, thank you so much, I'm well. And allow other people to celebrate that I was well as well. So yeah, that was a different barrier. Um, we've spoken a little bit about um, resilience. Laura, you were touching on that before. And Glenn, I know that you actually have some amazing things to say about resilience once you get back in the workplace. Can you talk about resilience a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, this is a huge topic um, you know, in today's world. Um, and everyone will have their own views on you know, what works best for them. Uh, it would probably be a whole session in itself. Um, but you know, if you just sort of pick out a few things um, you know, where... Um, I've sort of uh, tried to apply to myself and also you know, with the other colleagues who I've um, tr helped to mentor as they've been going through similar um, issues to me. Um, I think the first one uh, is a sort of um, what I call taking control. So accepting you know, that um, in, in my case, you know, anxiety, um, you know, is it's part of who you are. It's it's not going to go away. Um, you know, if if you experience it, it's likely that you will have that 
you know, that sort of um, challenge throughout your life. Um, but it is important, I think, to, um, to recognise and change your relationship to it um, and, you know, really think about how, um, you know, you can use it as a sort of empowering tool, you know, to sort of um, almost um, uh, bolster performance rather than, um, than um, inhibit it. Um, the second thing, uh, I suppose, is about um, thinking about how you work. So, you know, returning after work and going back to doing exactly what you did before in the same way as before, you sort of instinctively know is not the best idea. Um, and uh, so it's quite subtle, really, because, of course, you want, you want everything to go back to how it was. Um, but it's got to be a sustainable return. And talking about relapse, you know, I mean, you know, I had, uh, last year I had a, a, a couple of weeks out, you know, which was, you know, a, 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 what I call a sort of a, a mini relapse, you know, where um, I had to just reset myself. Um, and I'm realistic about, you know, making sure that I spot the warning signs, um, you know, before I get to, to that stage in the future. Um, so um, thinking about how I work and you know, being um, more sort of organised uh, in terms of not committing everything to memory, not relying so much you know, on the mind, but you know, good preparation, um, following through in terms of you know, the, the procedures um, and the things that I have to do during the day you know, whilst my mind is still sort of um, you know, relatively fresh. Uh, and you know, just not 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 trying to um, circumvent uh, proper procedures that really help you know to to take away some of the anxiety you know that, that exists from just doing everything on on the hoof. Um, mindfulness uh, is uh, a really big topic and one that has helped me a lot. Um, so there's lots of apps. Uh, I'm sure you you've all come across you know, and I've got into um, a really solid routine now of doing it every every day I do 15 minutes before I leave home in the morning um, and uh, you know I know that without it my sort of my day will not be as grounded as it would would be otherwise um, often I, I may not be completely thinking about what's being said um, on the app but it's giving me a bit of space you know to actually sort of sit and think about um, you know things will come into my mind things that might be important that I need to remember um, and it's just it gets away from that you know attacking the day um, you know and then sort of you know crashing and burning um, you know probably after a couple of hours and you know going back to the old habits so you know just all of that decompression I think is is really important um, there's loads more things but I know time is short so time is time is yeah. short but yeah there are loads more things thank you Laura could you mention a couple of things that you do to retain your resilience is there anything specific that you do throughout the day or throughout the weeks to make sure that you've got that touchstone um yeah undoubtedly for me um space um I'm happiest in a field with my wellies on surrounded by four-legged friends either horses or dogs to be fair and um I had that I for me it's a it's a, it's a must that I have to uh, do that maybe I mean I you know as much as you can with you whether I get up at five in the morning and go there for five minutes to the yard before um before work or whatever but um and also it's just space from people I mean I work with like thousands of people around me and computer screens and stuff and it's not my natural environment um if I were to choose it so um I'm not quite as good I don't actually set um 15 minutes aside in the morning but I do write a gratitude list every night hmm. and it's something that one of the tools that I was given when I left treatment and without fail um I write a gratitude list and they always said no matter how down or low you might feel you can always be grateful to have an arm or something but generally I could come up with 20 I mean in my illness I could barely think of one thing a week but yeah. now pretty much I can think of you know 20 things a day which is which I'm grateful for. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so there, there are some of the things. Um, connections, relationships. Yeah. Um, they always said choose the relationship over your food. Um, and that is much bigger in context of being connected with people. Um, and I'm a very tactile person, so a hug is for me is much more important than a message on WhatsApp or an email or something. So I try and keep connected physically as well with people. Um, but yeah. 
that's interesting. So what you're saying about the hugs, anyone, anyone that knows me or has ever worked with me, I actually have about three people at work that I, I just go and leech off like some kind of like succubus. And I'll, they know it, they see me coming and Robin will be like, do you need a hug? And I'm like, yes. Because there is something really important to, to having that touch for some people, not for everybody. And you do have to ask first, so just to get that out there. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that there's, um, there's, there's a lot to be said for the five ways of well-being, which is something that mine puts out. You know, the connectedness is a really big one. Giving back is another one. And then f for me, with the resilience, I cycle a, a lot. I keep a, a bike in, in London. And a lot of you, if there are a few people in this room that will have seen me in a meeting. I know that with my Norton Rose people, we'll, I'll, I'll come up and I'll have to get changed in the toilets because I'll cycle into that meeting to avoid the, the, the traffic or avoid public transport to kind of quell my fears. It was, sorry, there was just one thing that I just, really mm. recent that's happened actually. Um, the more I've talked about my situation at work, I've had other people talk to me. And actually, in the last weeks, I've got a little WhatsApp group and we're called Mindful, Mindful Ladies. <laughs> there is a guy that's joined too actually though, so we're not uh, you know, gender specific. <laughs> but um, it's actually remarkable. Like we message each other and you know, we might be sitting opposite each other, but it's helped so much. Um, just to know that you're not alone. And we're bringing more people into it. And there's people in, the, in it. This, this, this guy, I had no idea, had anxiety issues. And I've now made a personal point. We've had a conversation and he's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually incredible just to, that, to share. And then other people feel more able to share to you. So, yeah, that is something that a kind of a peer support WhatsApp group has really helped. Brilliant. Well, that leads seamlessly into what I want to ask Lucy. Um, I need that. I sort of just set so. them up and I can knock them down. Um, yeah, but I would, I would kind of want to talk about if, just if we could use the last five minutes. I mean, that this could go on for a couple of hours because I kind of, you've got so much to share. But Lucy, if you could kind of finish off this last five minutes and talk about some really practical tools that, uh, that people can actually walk away from this room and think, actually, that is a tool that I can put into place in the workplace. And Glenn, feel Feel free to, to also bounce in there as well. Um, so when I was talking about a person having an agency coming back to work, we've actually formalised that into a tool called a wellness action plan. Um, it's based on the RAP, Wellness Recovery Action Plan. Um, and so a manager and a member of staff will sit down and actually list down what they need to stay well at work. And um, what's really important about it is that um, firstly, the person has control over it. It's very much person-led. It's not a tool that we say to somebody, you've been ill, we need you to do this. It is very much actually, how do you feel about doing a wellness action plan? And the person leads it. It's not something HR sees. It's not something formal. It's very much a discussion between them and their manager. And that um, can be very initial conversation. There's been some difficulties at work. What you're presenting with some anxiety. How can we manage that in the workplace? A very initial conversation to somebody who might have quite a severe um, illness that they're managing. They could be um, bipolar or have severe anxiety or something. And it could be a kind of what are the red flags that we need to look for in the workplace and what are your emergency contacts and what do we do if you have an episode at work? So it can really go across the whole breadth of... Um, of difficulties and it's a really supportive tool and um, what I'm trying to do is use it in teams as well because um, the kind of work that we do in Bernardo's and the kind of casework that we do um, cuts across the whole team if you have a very difficult case um, in a service the whole team will experience that there can be some really traumatic situations so in team meetings and um, for managers to introduce it and say what does it look like as a team when we're well and what does it look like as a team when we're not well that whole peer support thing so staff can say Actually, I think when we're not doing well as a team, what we're doing is we, we're very closed. We don't talk to each other. We're not sharing things. We're not able to express. When we look well, we're coming in and we're hugging and we're talking and we're just sharing and, you know, and having that kind of discussion. So that whole well-being ethos and that whole tool is used really well. So that's a really positive tool we use um, very, very effectively, I think, at work. Um, the space and time thing is really important. We all get really, really caught up in our work and it's busy, busy, busy. And I think um, in our work, because of the kind of work it is, we kind of feel all of our work has to be, we have to be in front of the children, we have to be doing things that's so important, they're really needy. And my kind of message is actually you need to take time to look after yourself and be well because you're not going to be an effective caseworker for these children if you haven't looked after your own resilience and your own mental health. So take that time, be with your peers, have a cup of tea, 
go out for a walk for 20 minutes, have your lunch, whatever that is, that's the kind of message I'm really trying to get out, those kind of really practical tools. Kind of doing another case, doing more service user recording, actually isn't as effective as taking 20 minutes and having a lunch. So um, all those kind of small well-being things we're really trying to um, promote, and that's where I think um, someone like a wellness action plan can be really helpful. So uh, the wellness action plan, if you go into the Mind website, they actually have a template you can download for free. So uh, Mind website under the search and just put wellness action plan or WAP. You can find that there's resources on uh, Rethink Mental Illness website and also resources on the Mental Health at Work, the Heads Together. So Heads Together with Prince William, who was here earlier warming you up for me. Uh, he was, <laughs> he, he, they've put together the Gateway Mental Health at Work, which is an amazing online tool that will direct you to lots of things. Just in our last minute, Glenn, do you have anything to add about tools? Yeah, I think I the thing I'd emphasize, you know, and this is sort of with my employer hat on, um, you know, is the cultural change which this actually involves. Um, you know, so um, Lucy, you talked a bit about openness and um, you know getting a dialogue going. I think that's really critical um, that people can feel you know that they are able to um, to, to talk to others. Uh, one thing that we've done at work is introduce a bi-monthly newsletter um, where uh, you know I and others uh, who've had issues, um, you know, ranging from sleep deprivation, you know, through to cancer um, and mental health issues, you know, write a sort of blog about our experiences. Um, and I found that's been incredibly powerful. Uh, you know, people that I even really know within my organisation, you know, have, have said to me, you know, you're, you're so brave because in previous places um, that I've worked, you know, no, no partner would ever have um, put their head above the parapet and, and, and shared their experience in that sort of way. And I, and I really feel that it's that leading from the top down which is going to make the, the huge change um, in people's attitudes towards mental health. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're, we're watching the timer click into overtime. So, poor Glenn. Thank you so much for all of this. We do have time for some questions now, or is this... Uh, well, we don't, but if oh, you we want don't. to eat... We, well, we it depends how, how rigidly we want to look at this. If, you're, <laughs> if, you've had, if you've had enough coffee and cucumbers, then, you know, be, be my guest. So, over to you. If people, if people would like to ask questions, then I feel thought, free, and then you can should go. We just, should we answer one of these questions? Should it be the most popular one? Um, which one is the top one? Um, on the flip side, how can we support the team and the manager when a colleague takes a leave of absence due to mental health issues? How transparent should we be and should it depend on the individual and what they want to share? Actually, Lucy, I feel like you might be best placed on, to have a crack at that. Um, I think it's really important to support the team manager. I think we have to recognise that managers take on a lot of this load and I think um, it's a really important thing to, to make sure whether that's through HR or um, EAPs or whatever and I think that's something that's often overlooked that a manager kind of is fixing all the problems and then they're taking them all on so I think it's really crucial. Um, I actually do think it's quite dependent on the individual but I think that gives that, that's that agency and that strength for the individual. I think encouraging the individual to take control and sharing it's about a positive. It's not just saying, oh, it'll be easier if you told everybody. It's about actually for you, this would be a better place for you to work and it will give you some control and it makes it more positive. And having that discussion and helping them to do it. Um, we had someone recently, very quickly, who actually went missing and, um, and the, the police came to work and were really concerned about her as a member of our staff and it was obviously quite distressing for everyone at work. She was later found um, and she had a PTSD episode and she'd, she'd gone missing and, and went to have some treatment and she decided to kind of email the whole office and say, this is what happened to me, this is why it happened and I'm actually fine if you ask me about this at work and this is what... And, and she said that, was the, that made such a difference to her to kind of be able to come back and not feel, I've got to explain to everybody. And people, people were very nervous at work about her coming back. But then having her permission to say, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about it? Makes all the difference. So I think um, more transparent we can be, the better. But mindful of that person and having that conversation, having that support around them to do that. And I think management 
behind a person, supporting them to do that is really important. I think that, that that comes back to what this can happen is about, that comes back to what time to change is about, which is if we can uh, you know, eradicate the stigma attached to speaking openly about mental health problems, that this becomes a problem of the past in the same way that should someone go off with a different kind of illness, like for example cancer, when they come back, you know, they get sent flowers, when they come back they're welcomed into work because the stigma attached to that is now gone. So putting in place in the first instance, eradicating the stigma around it. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for your contribution today and thank you guys for being just really fantastic in general. But yeah, thank you very much. Um, I mean, genuinely, it's up to yourselves and if the panellists are happy to take more questions, I'm, I'm certainly not going to prevent you from asking questions because that's, that's why we're here today. And the coffee, I think, is you know, fair to medium. I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not personally looking for another one. So if, if people want to do it, Sarah, it's up to yourselves and the panellists. Uh, uh, my suggestion would be if you want to take more questions and people want to go into the next session, the main thing is that the next plenary is at 3.45. So okay. I guess as long as people are in for that, okay. up to yourselves. So yeah, um, does, show of hands, does anyone want one more question? There we are. Oh, <laughs> let, let the people speak. Huh? Let the people speak, OK. Um, Glenn, there's three questions up here for you, so I'm going to ask you one. Glenn, from a law firm perspective, you are truly an inspiration. Well done. How have your fellow partners been towards you considering law is generally an industry where mental health is seen as a weakness or where mental health is That's, a weakness? Thank you, whoever asked that question, because um, you know, that, that was exactly what was going through my mind You know when I realised that day that I couldn't cope, you know, I really thought my career was going to be over, um, that I'd never be able to go back and, you know, work in that high-pressured environment again. Um, but actually, um, what, what completely exceeded my expectation was, you know, that, that virtually every partner within my department came to see me um, personally at home. Um, you know, some that I was obviously closer to anyway, who you know were, were there throughout. But even you know, ones you know who who perhaps I wouldn't have seen every day at work, all came um, and really just wanted to tell me, you know, that uh, all that really mattered was that I needed to focus on getting well um, and not to worry about anything to do with work and that everything you know would be taken care of. Um, and it, it, that that was just hugely um, important to me, you know, because when you have uh, come up through, you know, the, the ranks with a with the firm and, uh, you know, you, 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 it's all about your reputation, really, and you fear that, that you know, everything you've worked for has suddenly been lost. Uh, and no, nobody, you know, we talked about, the, you know, the stigma. Um, but my experience has been at an extremely good one in that that's, that stigma was very much perceived rather than actual. Um, I, I just didn't didn't. And when I went back to work, um, you know, it t to me it felt like I'd never really been away. Um, and people, you know, uh, literally sort of beat a path to my door saying, you know, it's so great to have you back. And you know, even people who were even further remote from me in the business who I hadn't seen during that time, you know. Emailed me or phoned me and said, you know, so glad that you're back, and were really supportive. Um, and bit by bit, you know, I I, I worked on a reintegration, um, you know, into the workplace. Um, but I, I did have to really rethink how I did things. And there's times still when you know those old habits can start coming back, you know, and I say I'm tempted to work to, to you know, long hours and, you know, that, and I know that, 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 you know, I have to keep a lid on it really. So um, that, that, that's, it was a really good experience from my perspective. That's, that's refreshing. It's something that I hear a lot that uh, when I'm working with employers, which is that it's the self-stigma, it's the idea in your own head, as opposed to something else that your colleague is going to feel that often stops you returning. Right. Um, how about this one for you, Lucy, and then we'll call it quits, which is, what advice can you offer when it doesn't go well? So if you find it too hard, so at times when you have found it too hard or if you watch someone else doing it, what advice could you offer? Um, I think it's that fluidity. 
that it's not an absolute, it's not, you, you know, you've come back and, and that's it and that, we'll put some adjustments in place and there you go. Uh, I think it's that constant checking in and actually it might be okay when they come back and then it might be too hard or it might be really hard when they come back and then I need a bit more time and then it'll be okay. So uh, for me, it's that, it's that the phase return, but, but it's, mm. you know, it's just that constant checking in. It's that supervision. It's that wellness action plan. It's that recognition that this is not an absolute, that, you know, you've been off your back and it's all fine. And um, it is that um, management of that. And you may have to make different adjustments and bigger adjustments. It may be they have to be redeployed. It might be a different job. This job might not be the one they need to come back to. You have to look wider and you have to start looking flexibly. Um, it may be ultimately that the person can't stay at work and that's a really awful decision and it's a really horrible place for someone to get to. But I also think sometimes that's somewhere an organisation and the employee needs to get to and not to be kind of scared of almost having some of that conversation at the time when it's right because sometimes that is the right thing for both sides mm -hmm. and I think often around mental health a lot of organisations a lot of managers just find that we can't really do anything we can't really discuss it whereas actually you, you need to have those conversations and if it's supportive and you've tried lots of different options and we've done lots of different things that may be the, the ultimate outcome and hopefully not but, but generally I think it's fluidity I, I think it really is not just assuming that one kind of solution is it it's yeah. got to be constant it's got to change it's got to react thank, thank you i was going to say thank you for giving that hard answer I think, yeah just to hear those things i think um that conversation that you might not be right for that job anymore it it, it really is how you deliver that yes. to the person because as someone who has at times been kind of like oh gosh i'm not good enough to tell someone that actually you don't fit for that job anymore could actually completely demoralize them but it's about how you deliver that and the narrative around that is to actually this could be a, a better opportunity for you elsewhere and we actually when you come back you've developed these amazing it's all about how you deliver it um so to be yeah to be mindful of, of the nature of someone who has a mental health issue of me specifically yeah. that could have you know and i think also as you're saying it's, it's, it's very fluid is you know i still have therapy sessions and i you know i have one on thursday and it's in the middle of the day and i you know i have to just say I'm going to my yeah I'm doing it on Skype but you know sometimes I've had to leave early to go to a therapy session and and they're pretty good about that and it's you know it's, it's being able to ask for that and you know thank you so much so go and get your medium to fair coffee <laughs> thank you